Hi, Gary Weber. <laughs> we are. Uh, hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Hi. We are on this conference uh, toward a science of consciousness in Tucson, mm. uh, 2012, and uh, we're pretty much in the same ballpark. And why I am very grateful that we can make this interview is that you have come sort of to the sort of uh, to the end of the road or to the goal of where I am aiming. You mentioned last uh, yesterday breakfast that you're not thinking anymore, and I was uh, curious how is it not being uh, thinking. How, how uh, can you sort of be active and, and, and do stuff that is good? <clears throat> As we talked yesterday, it, it was a big surprise uh, when this happened 14 years ago. Uh, I had a big corporate job, uh, senior vice president, thousand people, quarter billion dollar budget, four research labs, and I suddenly had no thoughts. Hmm. And so immediately it was you know, a little energy arose, now you've done it. Mm -hmm. So I had to go through my morning routine, went off to work, and uh, lo and behold, nobody even noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that must say something about corporate leadership. Okay. If you can right. have no thoughts and at the same time function, and nobody notices. Yeah. But I was surprised that uh, speech emerges, uh, insights emerge out of no place. There's just emptiness, and at the right time, the right thing just seems to come up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't uh, encode the information. Let's say you're going to a big, complicated presentation. You still uh, read the exhibits, read all the financials, read all the reports. You come to the meeting, you just come to the meeting empty. As always, it stays empty. And you just wait. And uh, amazingly, some... Uh, really surprisingly good, better than I could have ever done, uh, insights mm -hmm. happen. They just appear. Okay. You can feel them arising and you just say them and it's all taken care of. Uh, it was a big surprise to me. That, that must mean that you have a lot of stored information already, of course, that you can act mm -hmm. from and that you have a good access mm -hmm. to it in this mood. True, true, but this was new information. I, mean, I had, you know, this was read, oh. the, read the information before you come to the meeting. Yeah. And it, the meeting was about the information. So I had just read it the day before, or the night before. Yeah. And I come to the meeting, and somehow, uh, amazingly, it got assembled and organized. And if a question arose in the meeting, an unexpected question, hmm. uh, often the surprising, uh, synchronistic, synergistic uh, answer would come forth. Okay. That was, that was far smarter than I could ever have been, and it made you look like the smartest person in the room. Okay. Smarter than what I was. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> uh, you're also the smartest person in the room. You look like it. Uh -huh. I wasn't. You look like it because you're there 100%. Uh -huh. There's nothing else taking your bandwidth, dragging you off to someplace else. You're just there. And in my terminology, that would mean uh, no, not so much fear. Yeah, yeah. The fear goes away. Yeah. I mean, fear goes away. Uh, Self-referential desires go away, and the ongoing self-referential narrative yeah. just stops. I mean, if you just, as we talked before, uh, I got turned on to deconstructing the I. Hmm. I've been told this was really the the key to happiness, and so I just set about doing that with a lot of Zen work and yoga work and different practices, and eventually it happened. There was experiences along the way, but there was this one that was fundamentally changed was I was doing a yoga routine. Mm -hmm. I'd done a thousand times before, literally, thousands of times before. And just in the middle of it, my thoughts just stopped. Oh, okay. And so it's a big surprise. But it, that's, it, it worked. The uh, thesis worked. If you deconstruct the eye, you can stop self referential narrative thought. But you are pretty unique. Unique. So, so there has been. Uh, Unfortunately. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Still, but there, there's, there's been the research uh, around your experiences, and, and mm. uh, what what was that about? Well, uh, I was fortunate uh, about that same time. 
that a lot of cognitive neuroscience came online. Mm -hmm. We had much better tools. Uh, this is a 40-year-long process till now. And oh, it's 40 years since it happened? Well, no, 40 years since I began meditating. I okay. had, had, a big, okay. had a big experience and started it, yeah. and then I meditated for 25 years. Okay. And then the experience happened, and that's been 14 years since then. So, but the, the, the good information and the good tools came online about the same time this page turned for me. And so we had lots of tools to work with mm -hmm. to try to understand it. Because I didn't understand, there was nobody around me that understood how it happened. But yet, in all those traditions, all the Indian traditions and in Zen, which I spent a lot of time with, uh, this is very much uh, where they're headed. They say that's where we're headed. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, not many people get there so far. No. We're trying to change that. Um, and I've, as I mentioned, I'm a subject in five studies. We're trying to find, I think we've got a good handle on uh, how this happened. Now we're looking back at it and seeing other people meditate. Uh, how different parts of this selfing network uh, come onto being and how they manifest and how yeah. they create uh, our fears, our desires, and our narrative yeah. about them. And the way that it, it's been studied is it's through uh, brain scans or, or yeah, some no neurological investigations? Or? Yes, uh, fMRI has been a big tool. Yeah. I mean, really, we have a lot of uh, high strength magnets with a very good specificity. Uh -huh. uh, the centers we're looking for right now and working with, a, I'm very heavily involved in a, in a project at Yale. Uh, we need to look for a very tiny, they call it three voxels, a very small area that's involved in the selfing network of one of the key nodes. It's a very selfing? Small in the what? In the selfing? Selfing network. What is that? Well, the network, uh, there's a good paper out of Harvard in 2010 uh, Andrews Hanna that looks at this and finds out that there are two main uh, switching centers, control centers, in the selfing network. Selfing network. Selfing network. Making up the self. Making up the self. Concept, yeah. Yeah. And there are also nine other centers that are associated with these two main centers. Okay. And so uh, one side of that is self and other. Mm -hmm. And if that side shuts down, mm -hmm. then the other goes away. and there's nothing but oneness. I mean, mm. Everything is one thing. The other side, which is self in, self in time, shuts down, then there's only now, mm. because there is no sense of you being an entity moving through time. Mm. So if you, can, if you can shut down the good news, if you can shut down the key centers, then the whole thing falls apart. But can you function then? I, I passed for functioning. Okay, so you, you, that happened to you in all those centers? What, 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 but at the time, 14 years ago, we had nothing to, to know that. No. But now when we look at this, this brain, mm. in fact, it shut down. I mean, okay. That, 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 that key center is shut down. And but you still accumulate memories, even though you're in the now. But there are different kinds of memories. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the kind of memories that don't get stored. No, please. Uh, I'm not finished yet. Oh, my yeah, apologies. Thank you. Okay. Huh? <laughs> the kind of memories that don't get stored are the self-referential ones. The uh -huh. episodic, yeah, okay, okay, autobiographical okay, okay, memories. Okay. The other kind of information, yeah. like, like learning facts that don't have a self in them, yeah. unimpeded. Mm -hmm. That's the good news. Because mm -hmm. you, can, you can learn information okay. that doesn't require selfing. Okay. If you ask to me, you know, how do I get to the interstate, or how do I get to the main highway, mm -hmm. there's an I in that because we language it in. Yeah. Our languages are subject-object based. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no sense of Jack being in there, no. uh, needing to go to the, the highway. No. They're just you know, trying to find the directions. So that's not an autobiographical, heavily emotionally loaded, episodic memory. It's just information. There's no uh, content to it that has an I, a self in it. And so the brain, fortunately, mm -hmm. can differentiate those. Okay. Good. Have you looked into psychological uh, interpretations of, of, uh, in this research work? Uh, the only thing that's been done is um, a fellow named Jeffrey Martin did his doctoral thesis. Uh, he started with 500 people who reported periods of, of long stillness or whatever words you want to use and picked 52 out of those and out of those 36 of us actually were in the study and he looked at uh, psychological development. There's a Washington University sentence completion test which is kind of the gold standard 
for coming up with psychological development. So okay. one to ten scale. And so we had the test. We took the test, and he gives all kinds of screening and you know, follow-up questions and interviews and everything else to come to this to, to evaluate us. And not surprisingly, all of the 36 of us were over five. Mm-hmm. Not a surprise because he already cut it down 90 percent, so it wasn't an open population for the whole world. Average was 7.14 on a, on you know, one to ten scale. Oh, okay. Uh, in in what uh, aspect? Uh, Ego development, but not ego in the way we think about it. Uh, ten is unit of consciousness. So <coughs> ten is? Ten is like unit of consciousness. Okay. Uh-huh. And only one of us, I was only one, was a ten. Uh-huh. And the rest of the people were between five and ten. Okay. So they were different places along this scale, but they weren't, we all didn't score 8.73, for example. It was a range. Mm. So within the people who report this, this illness uh, for fairly long times, there was a range of psychological development. Hmm. So if you look at people, you could say, well, you couldn't pick the people out in a crowd. We don't stand no, no. out any, there's no way you can look at us in a crowd and tell. No, no. So that was one, one test. Yeah. A second one, maybe not so psychological, is a mystical test. Hmm. There's a hood mysticism scale that was developed, and uh, he was on Jeffrey Martin's doctoral committee, and they gave us that test too, just how mystical are you guys. Mm-hmm. And this scale went up to 160. And it turns out that nine of us were the top of the scale on 160, as mystical as you can be. Okay. And you took took the average of uh, the bunch of us, and we still scored uh, 152 by average. And even psychedelic people only scored 150. Psychotics, uh, like 145 or something like that. Contemplative, someplace in the 140s. But surprisingly, non-dual people score the same kind of mysticism level as psychedelic people do. Mm-hmm. And um, we've got some good data coming out now, um, not out of our center, but out of the UK, that supports this, that the way the serotogenetic, the ones, the psychedelics that work by uh, serotonin uh, suppression or inaction, action, uh, which would be LSD, uh, ayahuasca, um, magic mushroom, psilocybin, that they operate the same way, mm-hmm. that they actually shut down these centers we were talking about. Mm-hmm. They deactivate these two main centers. Mm-hmm. And so it's not surprising that they see pretty much the same mystical situations that we see, because that's what the meditation does. It shuts down the same two centers. So we are in the way of ourselves. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And, 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 and the good news is if you get rid of yourself, yeah. uh, it's, it's so much better. I yeah. mean, everything is so much better. And yet you still completely function. <laughs> you still take care of your children. Yeah. You still feed. You know, you you still can work. Is it Jack Cornfield that uh, wrote about every peak experience uh, people, all of them, sort of, they're there for a while and then they get back to, to normal uh, standards. That's you, nice. hear, you heard about him? Oh, I know Jack Cornfield. Yeah. But, but I, I don't... I don't agree with that, obviously. Okay. No, no. And that's the whole that, thing. That's the whole thing behind the persistent, non-symbolic people, is they spend much of their time in this space, and and for me to have basically no thoughts, and that spends I, most of my time is in this mystical space, mm. and so I, I see you in a mystical way, mm. um, and, and I can't even really clearly recall what it, what it used to be like, but I but seeing you now, I I, I see you not as not as a discrete thing. No. I, mean, I, I can recognize Jack. I can recognize Jack's clothing and beard and his, and his eyeglasses, but at the same time, you can see that everything, cliche, is all one thing. And not just philosophically, but that's your direct, personal, ongoing experience. That this is, this is an illusion, and it's in a way I could have never imagined it would be. But it is true. You think, this guy must be crazy. But the whole thing can be seen to be an illusion. Even as you in the play in the play with it, mm. it's there. Strange, curious, yes, I know. But and but if, uh, as I'm interested in sustainability, yes, would you have any comment to, to that specific ob- uh, subject? Yeah, and as we mentioned earlier, I, I think we have to change our operating paradigm. Mm. We have to get out of being egos uh, with endless desires, endless needs endless problems, endless narrative, 
Uh, if we can, we can just somehow get an awareness that it's possible to reconstruct our egoic nature in a way that we can live differently, we can live more holistically, not because we're forced into it, but because we just don't have the same desires and needs and problems. And we were talking about that th that is about transcending and including, it's not fighting the... Yeah. But yeah. it's sort of including uh, what good it has done to us right. and then take on the next level of consciousness and self-image. Exactly. And I think these egos probably developed three, four hundred thousand years ago, best we can determine. And they developed probably out of communication mm -hmm. that you and I began to trade symbols back and forth. And eventually we developed a ways to talk about, well, there's, there's a zebra over there that you might have part of. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we languaged that. As we languaged it, we got into mm -hmm. subject and object. And so it then became, oh, then I've got a language. I'll start word symbols filled in, and then we started talking to ourselves, and we generated this egoic structure. But, but also, that, wherever there is two, there is fear. Yes. It's in the Upanishads. Yeah, so, so exactly. Separation is the, the separation where, where is, fear starts. Yes, yes. And so if, there's only, if everything's one thing, then your ongoing visceral fear goes away. Mm. That doesn't mean you're unprotected, because you actually respond faster, mm. uh, more appropriately, than when you were going around watching for lions in the bushes. I yeah. mean, you, the yeah. lions are gone. Yeah. The, the lions are now imaginary, mm. for the most part, or projected. So if you don't have those, then fear drops away. Mm. And you can live a much richer, fuller life. Uh, and have a lot of sustainable rock and roll. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my image, my it was, metaphor. Yeah, well, rock and roll turns you on. You may, you may find, you may find, you may find that yeah. in fact, rock and roll, it may or may not turn you on like it did before. Oh, it's, it's rather salsa. <laughs> sort of what? It's salsa that oh, I yeah, really yeah, exactly. like. There's no salsa then, whatever. <laughs> but you may find you like it more or less. Yeah. But at We're least, yeah. but, but the selfing part comes out of it. Yeah. There's no investiture in that particular, any, anything. Mm. That doesn't mean pleasures don't come. Mm. In fact, maybe surprisingly, without a self there, mm. the peak pleasures are even better. Mm. What you don't have, because there's nothing's interfering with them, there's no bandwidth being taken up by, by thinking about something else while the pleasure is taking place. But, but you have a lot of humor, and humor to me is when we, when we connect to truth and to the oneness of it mm. all. So you have an awareness of separation in my interpretation of what happens. Because, I mean, if, if we don't have, see the sort of the separation that gets overbridged by mm -hmm. humor, mm -hmm. we wouldn't laugh. Yeah. No, so you... I don't you, know how that happens. So, but we I'm as mystified about it as you are. <laughs> no, I really, there's, okay. there's nothing, there's empty inside. And I'm, I'm surprised at what comes out. Yeah. There's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says, Naiva kinchit kauramiti ito ito. What comes out? Pashyan shrinvan sprishan jigvan ashtan gachan svapan. It says, I do nothing at all. Mm. Is what the wise ones say. It's the first line. Then it goes through and lists all the things that you don't do. And the first part of the third line is speaking. And in fact, you don't do speaking. I don't no, have any, I, I have no sense of ownership <laughs> of speaking. I'm amazed at what comes out. Okay, yeah. It's, it's surprising to me, this yeah. to you. I have no idea where it comes from. I have no idea how it gets constructed. Life lives you. Life lives me. Life lives itself. Yeah. It just expresses. You just get the hell out from me. You just get out of the way. <laughs> you just get out of the way. It's surprising. Life can pretty well do itself. Yeah. Better than yeah. what we can do it. We just have to let go and get out of the way. Gary. Jack. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>